daunted to go after that, but we're really excited to be here. Um, one thing that we wanted to talk about as a panel is sort of the evolution of legal technology from the baby, baby beginnings up through AI and into the future. My name is Kat Casey. Um, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for a company called uh, Disco, Advanced Neural Networking based uh, e-discovery. Uh, but before that, I ran a global technology program with Gibson Dunn, and I was the big four. Um, I've got an amazing panel here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I will stumble all over it. So <laughs> if you want to go, Stuart. Um, hey there, everybody. I'm Stuart Levy. I co-head the IP and Technology Transactions Group at Skadden Arps. Uh, there's a student here. I think I had contracts here sitting in that chair, actually. Uh, no joke. Um, and so, in our, so, you know, obviously, I see technology as a lawyer uh, representing clients. I'm also on our technology committee in terms of sort of technology we intake to facilitate um, the practice of law. I uh, have a lot of thoughts on this topic, have many more thoughts after Richard's great, great talk, uh, which I'll share with you as we go forward. And I've seen a lot, as you can imagine, over the years of the evolution of technology from, you know, fax rooms to where we are today. Thank you, Stuart. I'm Joy Heath Rush. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the International Legal Technology Association. Uh, I've been in legal technology since 1982. Most of you weren't born yet, don't tell me. I don't need to know that. Uh, when a lot of what we did was, was automation and not transformation, much along the lines of what Richard was talking about. Um, prior to joining ILTA, I spent 28 years at Sidley Austin, not as a lawyer, not even playing one on television, uh, always in technology. And I also spent five years as an executive with a software company. And so we've been seeing that, that serve the legal vertical. So I've seen this um, problem from a lot of different places. And for those of you that are fond of such things, I accidentally sat in spot number 42, which if you're a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know what that means. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Colin S. Levy. Um, I am uh, corporate counsel for Salary.com, um, essentially their GC. Um, and the reason why I'm on this panel um, is I also run a website, uh, colinslevy.com, um, where I write about uh, legal tech, legal innovation, interview leaders uh, in the field, and also just recently opened up my own uh, consulting shop, if you will, to connect GCs with legal tech vendors. Uh, just had to do a little shout out for that. Um, and I've been following this field for uh, quite a while, um, and am trying to get my own company to buy into the stuff that I do, uh, which is a little bit of an uphill battle, but. I will get there. Well, thank you guys. So why don't we start with the very beginning, early, early on. I mean, I, I think most people think of law as a very human endeavor, but we started seeing technology creep in, mainly in automation, as you were saying. Early on, even in the early 80s, probably even before that, I, I'd love to maybe start with you, Joy, pick your brain a little bit about what did you see 1982 when you first got into the technology space? Yeah, it was really about two areas. It was about finance and document processing. Because when we think about what lawyers were making in the 80s, they were making documents. You know, um, that's, that was their, what they were manufacturing. And so they needed ways to turn documents around more quickly. And then, of course, the financial piece was very important. They needed a way to run their business that was a little bit faster and more predictable and that really matched the way that business was done in law firms, which was purely by the billable hour in those days, tracking expenses and those sorts of things. So it was taking stuff we were already doing and, and having it be done faster. But one of the interesting things about that, as I look back on it, is, is it used to say, oh, that means lawyers are going to go home and have dinner with their kids. That actually wasn't true. It meant they did 10 more drafts than they otherwise would have done. And so it was all about outcomes. It was about s using automation to do things faster so that we could do more cycles of the same tasks. So that, that was interesting to look at it at that perspective. So kind of looking at that lens then, did automation make it harder to hit your billable hour? Did it cut into your ability to make partner, to become profitable, or was it just it sort of got rid of that low-hanging repetitive task? Oh, it absolutely got rid of the competitive ta the repetitive tasks. And I think probably the most important example of that was in early days of litigation support. Um, 
And when we did something called Bates stamping, and I don't know if anyone's even heard of that, we used to have these mechanical devices that were physical stamps and you'd stamp each page of a document you were producing. And I can remember doing timesheets for lawyers of first year associates that, that had weeks at a time of 12 hours a day Bates stamping. No one would want to go back to that. Nobody would want to go back to that. So it was also getting drudgery out of law practice. But no, because clients didn't question the bills in the way then that they do now. I mean, a bill that we issued in 1982 from Sidley Austin would say for services rendered $85,000. And they paid it. That's just the way it was. It's not that way anymore. How about for you, Stuart? You're kind of in a different area of the law. How, how have you seen it from your early career to kind of as we're evolving? There's been a lot of shifts. Yeah, so there's still drudgery. Um, <laughs> like, it's, it's a misnomer to think like the drudgery ever goes away, it just changes. And it's, there's drudgery at every level, from first year associate all the way up, um, at large law firms, small law firms. Um, so I think that what's changed, the, so I think the technology falls into two different areas. Um, one is what facilitates sort of the, your day-to-day -day practice of law, and then the other, which a lot of the stuff that Richard talked about is, you know, does technology, are we at a point where technology actually can revolutionize the actual practice of law, which I look at as, as two different things. Um, I think the biggest change um, that I've seen is the speed with which you're reacting to clients. So, we, so I, I have lived through the phases of, um, oh, we want you to look at a document, we will mail it to you. <laughs> Actually, when I started, this probably, that phase had probably ended, but it was the phase of, we want you to look at a document, we'll FedEx it to you, you'll have it tomorrow, and then if you could mark it up and FedEx it back to us. Um, then we went to the fax machine, which is I'm sending you a document now, can you look at it today, it'll come through your fax machine. So you had to wait for it, and it came on like crappy paper, and it would come through, and then like sometimes it wouldn't go through. Um, so we went from that, then we went to email, so it was like, it's coming through, I just sent you a document, it's in your inbox, can you look at it right now? I've sent you know, something to your phone. Can you, I have a quick question for you. Um, we went through a phase, although it went away because I think clients don't like using it of texting. There was nothing worse than having a client like text you because then it was like, I don't know where you are, what you're doing, because you look at my text and answer me now. So the speed with which you need to respond to things has evolved dramatically. Um, the, the, it's interesting, you know, I've lived through something like pushback to technology. I remember a time when there was objection to voicemail because you would not want to call somebody and have like a machine answer the call. There should be like a receptionist who answers the call and like takes a message for you. And there was a pushback of, you know, voicemail. So then voicemail went like crazy and now voicemail's like gone away to the point that like there are no voicemail vendors left. Mm -hmm. um, no one even like looks, <laughs> listens to voicemail, like the worst way to communicate today. So there's been a lot of evolution, sort of the speed and and how you're dealing with technology, but I think, again, the new area, which is most interesting, is technologies that are evolving um, that could change the practice of law. And I'll say one last thing about that, then I'll, I'll stop <laughs> rambling, which is, um, so two things. Richard had a great quote, um, and I use this all the time. We do a lot of blockchain technology in our group. The technology is overhyped in the short term and underhyped in the long term. It's totally, I believe, where we are in a lot of areas, particularly with the applications of AI and machine learning to the practice of law. But the other quote I often um, cite, and this is true, again, with any new technology, and I've seen a lot of technology evolutions, is our initial reaction, this is true for everybody with every new technology, is think of like how we do things today and how will that work in a new technology environment? Like what will judges be like when there's new technology? What will this be like when there's new technology? And we can't get out of our heads, unless you're a really great innovator or an entrepreneur, to think of new applications. So it's sort of like saying today, so how did people like order cars from individuals who are just driving their own car, drive people around, like before Uber existed, before <laughs> mobile phones. Like the concept didn't even exist. It wasn't like, oh, now we do it easier. And so I think that's gonna be the big fundamental change is not thinking of how we do things today, oh, but it'll be different with new technologies, but rather there's gonna be new stuff coming that we just can't even envision yet. So instead of it being slightly better, slightly faster, slightly easier, it's going to be transformative. It'll be transformative, exactly, in ways we can't Maybe there are people out there, but most of us can't yet envision. How about you, Colin? What, what are you seeing? You know, well, from my perspective, um, I tend to be a bit of a skeptic. Uh, so um, 
what I see, frankly, in my day to day and also more generally is a lot of skepticism still um, with regards to um, technology. Not that there isn't a desire to use it, but there's a lack of kind of understanding of, all right, here are these tools. Now, how do we go about, you know, why would I want to do this when it's going to cost me not just money to pay for that tool, but cost me time to implement it when I'm just trying to build the business and I'm trying to grow the business and I don't need, I don't want to spend the time implementing it. So that is one problem that I see and that actually speaks to the problem I'm dealing with right now in my own company. Um, and I think the other thing I'm seeing is, you know, as, as Stuart mentioned, there is, remains a lot of hype about the present state of tech and how it's just revolutionary and it's transformative and it's going to be just the greatest thing since sliced bread. And at the end of the day, what we need to keep in mind is that tech is, is but a tool. It is a tool. Um, and if we treat it as a tool, then I think we can see more effects of it. Um, so short term, I agree with what the other speakers have said. Long term, I also agree that um, I do think that there's a, a revolution to come. I just think we need to let it come and not force it to come because it will come, but we need to just let it happen rather than try to say that whatever exists now is that revolution. Yeah, and I'd also say something to add to what Colin was saying. And um, when Richard was speaking about the neurology conference, I was reminded of this. So I have a friend who's a radiologist, and I said to him a, couple, about a year ago or so, like a radiologist's concern that like their profession is going to go away because computers can read images much better and quicker than humans can. And I thought he said it was interesting. He said, the radiology profession is not concerned because from the beginning, they have been a sector within medicine that has very much embraced new technology. It's sort of, you know, are you part of it or do you like sort of pretend it's not there? Um, and, you know, his view is we've evolved. Like our profession's evolved, we continue to evolve. Like no one in the radiology field feels like, oh, that's not going to replace us. So it's like it might, so we got to think hard about it. And I think lawyers are much more to the other side of the spectrum which is, like, if we pretend it's not there, <laughs> it won't happen. And I think we as a profession need to become a little bit more like the radiologists, which is there's new technologies coming, and we need to think about how we're going to be part of that and innovate around that rather than pretending it's not there. Yeah, and I mean, I think a couple things around that, too. There's a great quote that says, technology is what you didn't grow up with. Okay? Mm -hmm. So for the things that I think of as technology, you don't. Hey, that all of us think of technology, these students don't, right? Think of it as technology. It's just what my world looks like. So we have to be really careful about how we characterize what is technology. I think the second thing, and this gets back to, to Richard's kind of opening uh, premise about the drill in the hole, is we so often allow technology to become an, an, an end in itself rather than a means to an end, and we don't stop and say what problem are we trying to solve with technology. I mean, part of this issue of what it is that lawyers do, I've often had the opinion that at the end of the day, law is a relationship business, more than it is analysis business. And the thing that the machine can't do is provide empathy and provide that relationship that I'm in the hands of somebody who cares about me and my problem and my business. And, and so we have to solve those problems. You know, we have to know what the ultimate problem is we're trying to address with these tools. Right. Um, and, and just to jump off, off that point, I would say that I think historically lawyers have not been trained uh, to be empathetic, have not been trained in this what I call people management, which is really what the practice of law is. I mean, I would say a third of what I do every day is managing people. It has nothing to do with law. It has to be managing people, managing relationships. And so, you know, I think it's important to when you view the law that way, it's also important to view all right, the tech that way as well. In other words, how can the tech help me you know, with these relationships such that I can focus on the relationship building and not focus on the day-to-day -day repeatable standardizable tasks? Um, and it's important to be realistic about that and not, and I, I think, you know, while I said earlier that lawyers are resistant to tech, I think they also um, sometimes are too easily seduced by tech. They see a shiny object, they want to immediately go after it and pay a lot of money for it. But the problem is, then they're stuck with a solution in search of a problem. Totally. Really, you want to approach it in the reverse. You want to approach it from, all right, what is my specific problem I'm trying to solve, and how am I going to go, go about solving it? You have to meet people where they are. You can't force things. If you do, 
you're, this is a little bit crude, but I would say you're putting lipstick on a pig, essentially. Yeah, and I also would say that, um, and I think we, you know, throughout, as you listen to um, this panel and today, tomorrow, you know, it's very, the legal profession is a lot of different groups doing very different things with a lot of very different drivers behind them. So you've got, you know, my perspective, right, big law firms, you have corporate legal departments who are, you know, have their own drivers in terms of efficiency, cost, what they're doing. You have, right. Mm -hmm. right, you have small, you have small um, law firms, which could be anything from, you know, a 20-person law firm to a two-person law firm, you know, and what their needs are and what their drivers are. You have people doing public interest work um, who have very different, you know, drivers in terms of how they use and consume technology. So we don't have the legal profession you know, you have to constantly sort of be plugging into each of those because everybody, I think, is going to be looking at it differently. Part of the business is becoming commoditized. Part of it isn't. But, like, that's constantly moving. And where that line is is different depending on where you are within the ecosystem. Right. I think one thing to pay attention to is a lot of times, and I think Richard touched on it, we're thinking about AI in terms of replacing human cognition. The reality is a lot of the tools that are being employed across legal today are more about amplifying human decision making and reducing time to insight. It's more about augmented intelligence today than about fully automating, fully replacing humans. And so the question becomes, and maybe we dive in next into how are you using technology today to reduce time to evidence and to amplify your decision, but the question becomes how do you, as a new attorney or even as an emerging long-time practicing attorney, how do you future-proof your practice? How do you stay top of speed, understand the technology and resources that are going to help you differentiate yourself as an attorney when you've got much smarter clients now who are evaluating, why did it take you 5.7 billable hours to deal with this CID today? Last month it was a different attorney, it took them three hours. So having technology as a way to differentiate yourself, to, to really accelerate your path to partner for a lot of people in a lot of the big firms, and to create a differentiated and sticky practice. So kind of building off that, I'd love to sort of talk with you guys about how is technology, whether it's in the discovery space or contract analytics, AI, or even just more automation, how is it impacting your practice today? What are you seeing in your day-to-day -day life now? Whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, I mean, not being practicing, but I'll look at it from the standpoint of many, many law firms and corporate law departments who are members of our association. One of the interesting things I'm seeing is this kind of buy versus build equation or conversation, which was very much on the buy side for many years, is starting to move to the bill side, build side. And that is because there's a sense that tools provide a common ground on which to amplify your organizational intelligence and your organizational capabilities. And you have organizations like Brian Cave, BLP, I guess is their name now, that's doing some very interesting collaborative things that they consider to be extremely pro proprietary. I think the second thing is purely a business conversation. That is, there's sometimes that you want to, to address certain technologies like AI in order to amplify decision making. There's a really pragmatic view of it, and that is clients are not going to pay for human beings to do it at their rate of speed. So it's, it becomes a realization conversation. So if you're not a junior associate at absolutely. 500 bucks an hour that's still figuring out how to practice law. Totally, absolutely true. So if you have an associate that's spending 10 hours on a matter, on something, then the client will only pay for two, and the growth of legal operations has really amplified this problem, is wouldn't it be better to have that associate spend 10 hours on five clients doing two hours each that they'll all pay for? So the conversation becomes not what is the billable hour, but what is the pay forable hour. Joy, it might be helpful to explain what legal operations <clears throat> as a practice is, because I, I don't think that's probably something that's matriculated down into legal education right now, but sort of the increase focused on businessifying, which is not the most articulate yeah, yeah. way to say it, but kind of creating a, a more standardized approach to billing to all, all of the things that used to be, here's the $80,000 bill, now you've got to be a little and bit this more. This is something Colin is doing and Stuart's suffering from, I'm <laughs> sure, at the same time, is the growth of legal operations is really professional business people running law practices inside corporate clients. Um, you know, they were a cost center have for years, a very big cost center sometimes. Um, finally, more rigorous procurement practices have been applied to the procurement of legal services, and the legal operations people are really in charge of making sure that stays rigorous. And, and so one of the things they're doing is taking that bill and, and getting it down to how many minutes are you spending on this, and we will only pay for this many minutes on this issue. And, and there's a tremendous amount of scrutiny on bills. So again, if, if you know your client's only going to pay two hours for a certain task, 
don't charge them more and don't have someone do it for more than two hours, use technology to apply to that problem. And some of so, my largest corporate clients were applying AI to multiple years of billing, asking for funds back, absolutely. and then making predictions based on it. So you jump Yeah, so I feel we're mixing, we're mixing up a couple of concepts. So billing pressure for sure, truer than it ever was, absolutely true that um, sort of corporate America um, has all sorts of billing rules and scrutinizing billing 100%. That technology is the answer to that question is not, I think, at all like the flip side of that, meaning that, so, you know, they don't want multiple people on a call, they want to, you know, control how much a specific task costs. Mm -hmm. The solution to that is not necessarily like, oh, let's just automate it, because there, A, there isn't always automation involved to solve for that problem. In fact, I would say in, I don't know, eight or nine out of 10 cases, there's not. And the second piece of it is that clients, and again, I'm looking at it for a second for the big law perspective, and then about smaller firms, clients in, in big law practice drive what you do and don't do. So we never, and this is true of every big law firm, you never make a decision like, oh, we're just gonna automate this, or oh, we'll run this through this new you know, vendor algorithm we have instead of like having associates look at it. You never would do that unless the clients either push that technology on you or has approved it, and the, actually it's more the former case than the latter case. Mm -hmm. It's very rare we say to a client like, oh, we've got this you know, thing we could do, and the client says, oh, that's good. It's usually like, hey, we want you to do X, we know about Y technology, can you use Y technology? So that's when the big law firm space, so technology not always a solution, and much more driven from the client side than law firms pushing it out. I think to your, you know, your question, to, to small firms, um, you know, part of the challenge, and I know from friends of mine who are in small firm practices, is finding technology that can enhance your practice because, you know, you're wearing as a small firm and also someone who's doing sort of public interest law, you're probably wearing the hat of practicing law, um, building your practice, so getting clients, and then just running your legal practice. So if you're at a big company or big firm, you know, you've got people doing that for you. If you're a small firm, public interest, firm, you're doing all that yourself, so finding technology that can make your workflow better, easier, whatever, is much, is almost much more important, because that really translates really directly, and I think, to how you're practicing law, even more so than at large firms or in-house. Yeah, just to, just to add to what Stuart was saying, I mean, from my perspective, I, myself, am always looking for tools to try to make processes more efficient, uh, more predictable, more standardizable, so that I can spend my time being the sole in-house counsel on kind of more higher level, more higher impact work, and don't have to spend my time every every day, you know, spending two hours reviewing a, a contract that I've seen a million times before with the same objections and insert the same language over and over again. Um, but going back to something that that Stuart said earlier about big law firms that I want to touch on is, is this notion that big law firms are looking to clients for guidance as to what they, how they operate and what they do. And I think that's an important point to re be emphasized because I think that, you know, there's a lot of talk in, in I'd say, some legal tech circles and the echo chamber, if you want to call it that, um, about how things need to change. But the only way things are going to change really is if the clients drive that change at the big law firm level, I would say, because clients are the people that are paying these law firms to make money. So it's up to the clients, but you have to educate the clients. The clients need to be educated, and I think that's changing on the client's behalf. I think clients are becoming better educated. So I just wanted to yeah. throw that out there. Um, going back to what I was saying earlier about process improvement and, and, and tools, um, you know, for a small law firm or in-house, um, you want to, you know, it is all about how can I practice law better at lower costs. Legal operations helps with that. I'm a small enough department, I don't even have that. I kind of am the, the go-to for everything, for better or for worse. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it, it's about making the internal clients or external clients at the end of the day happy. And, and whatever can help with that is really what the focus is. And, and so you know, I think at the small level, it's, it's, you know, you take a very more pragmatic kind of approach because the costs are a lot more impactful, I would say. Yeah, you know, just to give an example of what Colin said, this is a great point. You know, and it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a very, very non-tech example of this, but it's a great example of this. So for a few years now, there's been a, a cottage industry of firms within India 
who do due diligence. So they'll review documents either on the corporate side or on the evidentiary, on the evidentiary side. Obviously, like with so many industries at a much, much lower price point, you know, than even medium-sized law firms within America. Um, so that existed. It did not become a thing that people did until clients would walk in the door and say, so here there are these companies in India, would you consider using them? Like it was not us saying, you know, we could do this project and if we got like this Indian firm to do the diligence, you know, your bill would go down 40%. It was only when clients um, were sort of pushing that into the law firm space that that industry really took off. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And there's actually a flip side to that, which is there are cases in which clients actually impede our ability to move forward with technology. And I think that use of cloud-based technologies mm -hmm. is a great example of that, um, is that there are many clients who are very cloud-averse in terms of their data being stored you know, in, in a place that's publicly accessible. And in fact, Microsoft will tell you that there are three groups um, that are the most cloud-averse. Um, number one is the press because they're very worried about their, their sources being revealed. The second is, um, is nation states like Pakistan and Iran, who don't want to be in the cloud in the US. And, and the third is law firms. And that's an interesting group of company. And it'll be because client outside counsel guidelines, which is something you will learn about when you're practicing in a law firm, uh, will say, we don't want our data in the cloud. And it actually keeps us from making some advancements in technology that we would like to make. That's say we're on like the precipice of a tipping point though. I, a lot of my clients, from when I was at Gibson running the global mm -hmm. tech program and even now, big banks, big pharma, and what's happening is they're talking with their cloud committee and they're like, oh, are you logging in online to get to some tool? Are you processing client data using a third party vendor? To me, that's distributed resources, which is cloud. So there's, there's been a shift, even though I used to get very proscriptive, do not use cloud from you know, the UBS of the world. Mm -hmm. It's shifting, and I think it's out of necessity, and I think it's also out of fear. We had a couple major breaches where um, one major firm, I think they lost $100 million because they had a denial of service attack for eight days, not even including the reputational damage, and people are realizing, do I want to rely on the $13 billion a year that AWS spends on security and infrastructure, or do I want to rely on a much smaller law firm that has competing interests of profits per partner and their IT infrastructure? So it's, it's not changing, but it does feel like on a precipice. Yeah, no, that, that, I want to touch on that last point because that's an amazingly important point um, because that's a hell we're actually going through right now uh, and been going through for a while, but, a lot. <laughs> but particularly for, for one client. Um, so the financial services industry will not allow you to put on your system um, any sort of, you know, Dropbox, Google Docs, you know, any sort of sharing like that. The crazy thing is that their concern is that you'll cut and paste documents into like Google Docs and like walk out the door with it. The fact that you could print the documents and put them in your bag and walk out the door with them <laughs> seems to like escape them. <laughs> you know, like if I was like looking to take 20 documents, I think instead of cutting and pasting, I would just like print them and walk out with them. Um, but that's a, that's a really huge issue. And, it, and the bar that they're setting for security, and so if you're, if you're a law firm of any size in the United States, you know, you've got some financial services client out there and the bar that they're creating in terms of what you're allowed to do and not do is getting dramatically higher and higher. So is, you know, another great example for us is that they, they no longer allow you to access their data. So, so once you know, it's for one client, you're not gonna have two computers, right? It's gonna, they're setting the standard um, unless it's a firm issued computer, meaning you couldn't just take your own laptop that you're taking with you on vacation anyway and then like log in and like do work because like who knows what's on there. You've got to only use a firm issued laptop. Um, so great raising like that bar is a great point about how you know clients can sort of impede the adoption of technology from a security perspective. And they change their minds also like every year about what they want, what they don't want. Everyone's got like some different standards. Firms that had a lot then loosen them, then they were loose and they tighten them. But it's a great point. That's really a big challenge today. I would say I completely agree. I would also note that I've seen an increase of at least asks, how are you using technology to create efficiency in RFP responses when you've got a potential client trying to engage with you as a law firm? And you know, I'm curious what that means in your mind for practitioners on a go forward basis. How does this increased interest, if not knowledge, by corporate clients in using technology, whether it's in the discovery space or contract analytics or knowledge management, how is that impacting the way 
you as a practitioner or you as a legal technology expert, uh, educate yourself and interact with them. And what's the impact for you? I'd like to hear from the client. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm constantly reading things. I'm constantly um, taking classes. For example, I just completed, um, well, fairly recently completed Suffolk has this online legal certificate and innovation program uh, that I completed. It took me about um, a, a year or so. Um, but I engage in that kind of work because I know as, as a lawyer and as a client of law firms that it's incumbent upon me to adapt to whatever the environment is, whatever the demands of the environment are, whatever the um, various processes that are currently in demand exist. So it's incumbent on, on me as the lawyer and as the client to kind of know a bit about what I'm talking about, what I'm looking for. So to that extent, I, you know, I educate myself, I adapt, I, I change. Now, as for other lawyers that are in similar positions to mine, working in-house and are both attorney and client, I think that there still is a lot of work to be done in that area, but I do think that there's a fair amount of, of client interest in kind of seeing what's out there, seeing what's interesting, and trying to get themselves up to date. Um, but it's more than just getting yourself up to date. It's, I, you know, if you're a lawyer, it's incumbent upon you to actually know what those tools are, because the likelihood is, as was kind of alluded to earlier, um, is the clients are going to already know, and they're going to be asking about it. So it's incumbent on, upon you to be able to answer their questions because if you can't answer their questions and don't have that knowledge in today's environment, they're just going to go elsewhere. We could have a whole conversation hour long about RFPs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's such a, a difficult process. I, I know this. Oh, oh, so uh, or a beauty contest as we call it. So a client <laughs> sends us a bunch of standard questions that we answer to get a chance to bid on engagement. So. Um, and they've changed. They used they, to be diversity, headcount, people are about people. Now it's more like tech focused. Are you innovative? Mm -hmm. that, that's another the I word. Lots of yeah, people. it's a buzzword of, of the day. Um, I think that my answer is going to be non technical. Is you have to take a question like that and use it as an opportunity to have a client conversation because different things drive a question about technology. They want to know, I mean, when I talk to corporate counsel at, at big organizations particularly, the, the word that is the top of their list is predictability. Mm -hmm. If a matter's gonna cost $180 million, it's gonna cost $180 million, but I wanna know that's what it's gonna cost. Not that I think it's gonna cost 40 million and it costs 180 million. And so you, you find out what are you looking for in technology? Are you looking for better outcomes? Are you looking for quicker turnaround? Are you looking for, um, that is you're trying to figure out again, you're trying to solve the problem of the whole, not, not the drill. Well, and what's the whole? The whole is you're a storyteller as an attorney. And so what, what is this millions of dollars we spend on discovery? What is this co copious amounts of due diligence we're doing? We're trying to figure out the who, what, when, where, why to tell our story to the regulator, to tell our story to opposing counsel, to create a narrative. And all of these tools are hopefully reducing time to that evidence and insight. But you need to keep focused on the why. It's, it's not, oh, I want to touch every document. Oh, I want to Absolutely. use the new shiny thing. It's, I want to be able to do what I went to law school for, which is practice law. And I need to be empowered with the information to do so. Yeah, although I would say that, because um, we do plenty of these RFPs, requests for proposal, um, which are really annoying, because it used to be clients hired you, they didn't hire you. Now you have to like sort of you know, spend all this time explaining why they should hire you. Um, it's interesting. I, I think, so we probably see more technology questions than we used to. If I had to bet, I would think there's no client out there who's making a decision based on your technology. They're, it's an efficiency decision, yes. and they're basing it on, oh, we've done three just like this. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not going to have to invent the wheel. We're not going to have to think about this. We've done, you know, th this, this exact project or very similar project for these three clients. We have these experts. We're going to be faster than the other firm because we like we know how to do this. I still think that's what makes clients more comfortable than so if you have client one who's got that expertise and client who doesn't have that expertise but says oh but we've got all this technology you know behind the curtain. I still think in 99 or more out of 100 cases, clients going with at least today with scenario one, and that still makes them more comfortable than the technology piece. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would say from my perspective as someone who interacts with outside counsel and uses them, um, that, that still is very much the case. Is, you, know, you can have all the tech in the world, but if you don't have the expertise I'm looking for, I'm not going to I'm not going to care. I mean as much as I am a techie, I'm still not going to care cuz at the end of the day, I need the expertise. That's what I'm hiring you for. I will also say though that if you can have the expertise and have tech to help you do it faster and better and cheaper. And cheaper? Right. I'm all over you. You're going to be my new best friend for the period of time for which I I need you for that matter. But again, expertise really does matter a lot. And so I think that's Something I think for law firms who try to promote themselves as being innovative or really techy or what have you, um, you know, need to keep in mind that it's not just all about the shiny tech. At the end of the day, it also is the expertise because no human, or, excuse me, no human, <laughs> no machine, um, as Richard noted, is, you know, we're not, that is not where we are right now. Um, Kat, I'd like to get back to a, a point you, you made earlier about stickiness, because we really didn't explore that too much. So when we talk about stickiness, we mean once you get your foot in the door and they've hired you, you want them to keep you, and they want, right. you want them to give you more different kinds of work, because you're, if you're a large firm, you have lots of different practices. Is where you really have an opportunity with technology, I believe, is in stickiness. Mm -hmm. So when you think about answering that question, you think about technologies that stick. I, I, an example I know of at a large law firm some years ago is there's a particular kind of transaction that didn't used to be legal in the US. I don't know if, it, if it's still that way of what they call collateral swaps. Mm -hmm. So in Europe, you can secure a loan with some collateral and then change that collateral halfway through the loan, which couldn't be done in the US at the time. Whether it can now, I don't know. But, but a system was built, a specific law firm built a system to automate the tracking of collateral swaps. The client was so delighted with that that when the partners from that firm went, made a lateral move, the client went with them primarily because they wanted access to that proprietary collateral swaps business so or piece of technology. So there's a really interesting stickiness component to technology which shouldn't be overlooked. I agree I, completely. Yeah, I was just going to jump on that and, and say that um, I think, you know, you also see this this development of kind of niche firms that focus on just one thing and offer that service and do it really well. And they're very successful for exactly the reason that Joy just mentioned, which is that stickiness factor, mm -hmm. which is that this is what we do. This is all we do, but this is what we do, and you're not going to find anyone better at this than what we than, than we. And so I think that's that's really, you know, something important to keep in mind. And then on the other side, in terms of law students or lawyers, you know, that are interested in jobs, I think the way you stick with with the company or with a law firm is you offer some degree of expertise in an area that which other people don't either don't have or you have different skills from other folks have and you can show those skills off and be able to use them effectively. And um, you know, that's that's how you kind of differ differentiate yourself I think, and, and stick around. Um, with that said, you know, it's incumbent on, on students and also law schools, frankly, to educate students, to give them these tools that can allow them to succeed because, as Richard noted, you know, the environment we have today is not going to be the environment we're going to have 20 years from now. The velocity of change around us in terms of, I mean, look at your phone. How many different AI-enabled applications are on there? How many different ways of communicating in short bursts are out there? And how many ways are your future clients communicating to each other, potentially nefarious facts? That's all in scope, whether it's WhatsApp, WeChat, Slack, Skype, you name it. So staying top of speed. And I, I think in some respects, uh, speaking on kind of ripping what you were saying, Colin, it's going to be partly specialization, which can differentiate you from your peers. And it doesn't mean you have to code. It means you have to be able to translate technology in a way that's non-threatening to non-technologists. I'm an existential philosopher that's head of innovation at a, uh, <laughs> at a pretty big firm. But I'm very good at explaining complicated processes in a way that's non-threatening. That's something that I think a lot of the folks in this room could differentiate themselves with. Absolutely. The other thing is Absolutely. we're at, I feel like we're on a roller coaster, like we're going up that last little bit and it feels like you're about to kind of go over the edge and down to mass adoption. There's a lot of FOMO going on, fear of missing out. A lot of companies are saying, oh, I want an AI committee. Oh, I want to embrace AI. They may not know what it is. They might just think it's shiny, but we're at a tipping point, which to my mind, whether it's Moore's Law or whatever, the adoption rate is growing exponentially, which means for young lawyers, heading out today, technology, well, that is the language of business and how you're going to get your insights is going to be via technology because the pool of data is bigger, messier, more complicated, but your job is still the same. So kind of going to another point, 
I, I feel like there's a big tipping point, but there's also been a lot of historical resistance to adopting advanced technology. You know, I, I'd love your thoughts on you know, what's been holding us back and, and where are we today in terms of different areas, because there's a lot of different areas that tech is permeating. And maybe start with you, Stuart. I, I think you've yeah, got a I good... Think, but I, I don't think actually we're at a tipping point. I mean, I take what Richard said. I think we have a, we have a long road ahead of us. We'll get maybe to a tipping point. I think, I think the resistance, I mean, I just know from, you know, being on the technology committee and seeing, you know, vendors come into us is, like, things that seem, wow, that would be amazing if it really did that, don't really do that, or they do that in such a rudimentary fashion that it's not, you know, worth implementing. It might be, you know, in 2030, but it's not, it's not yet there today. Um, so I think the resistance isn't so much, you know, that, it's sort of that it's not there yet. And again, I distinguish between sort of workflow technology, which is, you know, attorneys saying I want to be able to be on my mobile phone and record my time and not have to go back to like a desktop computer to do that because it'll just make my life easier. I want to be able to access documents easier. Like that, that workflow piece is moving very fast and constantly changing. We're constantly doing, I think all firms are, new stuff. But I think the idea of like sort of AI and sort of really replacing what we're doing, um, I, I think it's just that, you know, what we're seeing is not there yet. I, this great anecdote, our, uh, our head of technology, Peter, <laughs> you know, said to me, uh, so there's this, I won't mention the, the company, this company out there has, so we, we do a lot of privacy and cybersecurity work in our tech transactions practice. So this company has a new tech, uh, privacy and cybersecurity tool to help lawyers, and they use IBM's Watson technology. It's like, wow, that's incredible. So can you speak to this person? So I see this person. She explains to me, like, everything they do, and I said, okay, like, you know, it sounds like 100 other products I've heard, which has, like, oh, we've got every reg and every law, and you can search for, like, you know, a data breach notification requirements, and we update with any new development, you know, all this stuff. So I was like, okay, great, you know, there's a lot of vendors out there, but, like, there's this, like, IBM Watson piece to this I'm not seeing, and, like, there's this pause, and she goes, Watson. And then, like, you almost see her, like, flip, hair, like, flipping through her, like, you know, oh, right, I'm supposed to mention this? And, like, the way they were using Watson or semi-using it was so not important to, like, what the, you know, the main product was. It was clearly just a, like, oh, we'll get firms to listen to us if we mention that we're doing this. And it was, like, so obvious. And so, you know, we didn't use them because we just, like, every other product we had in that same space. So there's a, that, that is just representative of a lot of experiences we're having say in the last three to five years. I think it will change in the coming years, but I don't think it's like we're at the horizon of that yet. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Stuart. I, I think um, you know there's a number of factors at play here. I think one of them is the fact that there is a lot of stuff out there that promises to do something and doesn't actually do it or doesn't even perhaps exist, uh, AKA vaporware. Um, or at least have this term for it. Um, and th I think the other factor is that there's this tendency for firms to see tech not necessarily as a tool, but as a marketing employee, essentially as a means of, all right, let's get clients to come to us because we claim we have the most innovative lawyers and the most innovative tech, or we use Watson in, in your example. Um, but then when you delve a little deeper, you realize it's kind of just window dressing. There's really nothing there. Um, and I think other factors to, to keep in mind with regards to resistance, I think, is the fact that, again, lawyers, the legal profession, it's a stodgy profession, it's a stodgy industry. We've all been taught to do law, practice law the same way. For many, many years, law firms, or excuse me, law, um, law schools continue to teach in many ways, the same ways that they have taught for years and years and years, which is all great if you want to learn theory, not so great if you want to actually be a lawyer. Um, so which is why you see the rise of practical skills-based courses, more tech-based courses, that sort of thing. I think the other part of it, too, is that um, lawyers don't necessarily have the time to fully understand what they want. They just know they want something, but they don't have the time to understand exactly what they want. And so they don't have a means of kind of connecting the dots. And so, in a sense, they're just operating under, oh, we'll get it once we know what it is. And yeah, we'll know what it is at some point without actually defining when that point will be and not taking any action to get to that point. So, you know, I think there's a lot going on here and it's a lot of people attribute it to, again, just lawyers being lawyers and stodgy and magicians, which 
historically has been true. We're not magicians anymore. At least I don't consider myself a magician. Uh, the curtain is always open on my end. Um, but you know, you have to consider kind of the broader, broader picture. Um, I think you know we'll get there. The resistance is is decreasing, but it's not decreasing at a rate that I would say is you know exponential. But it's it's decreasing. Yeah, I think one of the biggest issues here is around adoption. Um, of tools is, is there's a seductive aspect to the brightest and the shiniest and the latest, but then you say, I don't really know what I would use it for. Like I see this really cool glass fish and it's pretty, but I don't have a place for it in my apartment. Or it's really uh, hard to set it up. It's really hard to set it up. Yeah. And, and I think that there's also some mythology here is if I hear one more person say lawyers hate technology, <laughs> is lawyers love technology for the most part, at least in my experience. We did not force iPads on lawyers. They brought them to IT people and said, this makes my life easier. Help me incorporate it into my practice. Help me support it. What lawyers like is simplicity. Right. They want things that are easy and intuitive and solve a specific problem. And too many times when we implement technology, we focus on this, here are the five steps of how to use this tool, not the here's this problem you have in your practice, and here's how you're gonna address it with this piece of technology. Um, and, to, and to get back to the cloud conversation just a little bit, because it's, it's, it's important here. All these organizations that, that are cloud averse, and you'll say, do you use DocuSign? And they'll say, it's the most indispensable tool in my <laughs> arsenal, because it lets me automatically sign documents, and it's 100% cloud-based. So they don't care about it mm -hmm. if it's something that's really useful mm -hmm and really easy, and that's the thing. And you can't get away from that core problem you're trying to solve. Some products are, or systems take multiple months to implement. And by the time you get into month 18, you may not remember what the problem was in month one you were trying to solve, or the problem is morphed. And if you don't keep that to the front of your mind, you're not gonna be successful. I think that's an important point. A lot of times we think AI is an easy button, and I brought in contract analytics solutions, spent about a half million on the tool. To this day, a year and a half later, we're still building out a taxonomy, building out the, the structure that we use to find anomalous clauses, meaning 18 months in, still not being deployed. And not being deployed because it's bad, but being not being deployed because it's a heavy lift. It requires yeah, a lot of understand. time. I understand. Mean, my favorite old example of that used to be lawyers that asked me to install Excel on their desktop, mm -hmm. which lawyers used to not use. And I'd install Excel, and they'd be like, well, how do I do an amortization schedule with this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do an amortization <laughs> schedule. You still have to know the math. Excel doesn't help you if you don't understand the math that you're trying to do. That's part of the issue here. Yeah, I think that, that speaks to a really important point, which is that uh, which is kind of the education point, which is that, exactly. you know, uh, there are tools out there that are great, but you need to know how to use them. And even before that, you need to know, all right, does this actually solve the problem that I have? Exactly. I may like this piece of tech, that's all well and great, but, you know, 18 months in, is it going to actually solve the problem if it takes 18 months to implement or however long it takes to implement? You know, it, it's this, I wrote about this on my blog a little bit. I call it the, um, the seduction problem. Um, it's just, you, you're too easily seduced by tech thinking like it will be an easy button or, you know, it just will solve all your problems. It is not a panacea. It is not. It is nothing but a tool. And you need to remember that as applied to your problem. And that, require, and that requires understanding also what your problem is. You may think, oh, of course, well, I'm going to know what my problem is. You may not, because you may know what the symptoms are, but you may not actually know what the problem is that are making those symptoms appear. So it's, it's a process, and you have to be fully engaged in every step of that process to make it through. And um, frankly, you know, I think there are a lot of lawyers who are keen on getting to the tool part and on fixing the part, but not on the process part of going through what you, the steps you have to go through to Most get there. Most legal tech projects fail because of adoption. Mm -hmm. That just is true. It's not because it's bad technology, it's adoption. Yep. In some areas though, and I think in particular discovery, data is just getting so big. There were cases I couldn't throw enough humans or money at. It was 86 terabytes, that's 86,000 gigabytes. There was not enough human manpower or money or anything to do it, so I, I had to try these new technologies. So I, I feel like there's a competing pressure of, I want to keep doing it the way I've been doing it, 
I'm very successful as an attorney because I've done it this way all the time. And the universe of data is so much bigger, I can't get through it without relying on some technology. It's a great point, and I think part of it gets back to outcomes. Um, I was at a legal tech event in Australia earlier this year, and the keynote speaker was Connie Brenton. And there are some of you that, that know Connie mm -hmm. well. Um, she's in the GC's office in legal operations at, at uh, NetApp. And her kind of aha moment for me was law, lawyers need to talk to me at my outside counsel about what level of outcome I need. I don't always need an A-plus level of outcome. Sometimes the C level is fine because what I'm really trying to do is minimize the cost of something that I know is going wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's a great place to introduce technology, is to say that maybe this technology that deduplicates documents in e-discovery is only 98%, but actually that's good enough because I don't have enough people to throw at it, and that will give me what I need to satisfy my outcome that I'm trying to achieve. And it's, it's having that conversation. Again, so many technology issues are really relationship issues. You have to have a conversation about what are you trying to achieve? What outcome are you trying to, to, to deliver? No matter how much tech you adopt, there's still very human characteristics that are going to inform your decision. It's, um, it sort of goes back to that augmented intelligence. We're not looking at robots and you know, Skynet replacing us. We're looking at tools and technology to optimize us. Kind of speaking in that vein, I, I think we have different ideas about where we are on the, the adoption curve, but I'd love your, your thoughts on what's that wish list? What, is, what would that future of legal practice married with technology look like for you? And anywhere, whether it's you know, online courts or if it's just day-to-day -day what's in, impacting you, start with, with you, Stuart. Yeah, I think I come back to um, what I was saying at the beginning. I don't know the answer to that because I don't think there's things that we do today where I wish there was like a technology solution for that. Um, I mean, maybe at the margins, like we have a really good precedent file. If there's a way that, you know, it could pull in things more automatically than it does today, maybe a little bit. I think the big change is going to be something, you know, we, we're not seeing today that's just going to will revolutionize the practice of law, but it's not like, oh, we're doing it this way today, but we'll do it like faster and better like in 10 years. It's that it'll, it'll just change the way, you know, lawyers and law firms operate. You know, my Uber example, which is not like, oh, we used to do it this way, but now we do it like on our phones. Mm -hmm. It'll be something, I think, entirely different that we're just not quite there yet at. Yeah, I mean, I, I would kind of take the same view. I think that um, it's very hard to say kind of what that future will actually look like other than it will look like something we're probably not expecting and something bigger than what we're expecting. In terms of the time frame, um, that I think is, is difficult to say. I think that, um, you know, at the rate of technology and how it changes, I mean, five years from now, there could be something that, I'm sure will be proclaimed will be you know changing the world and then 10 years down the line it will turn out that that actually was just a step in the in the direction of where we want to go um you know in terms of i would say the more immediate future um i think you know obviously automation is going to continue to have a greater greater impact i mean ideally for me um, a lot of the kind of the routine work that i currently do that i've kind of alluded to not wishing i had to do um i could see being, you know, automated and me just kind of handling other stuff. Um, but it's it's just, it's very hard to say because there's a lot of factors impacting it. There's also, quite frankly, the economy. I mean, there's, you know, currently a huge appetite for certain forms of legal tech, um, particularly workflow management tools, contract management tools, um, that type of thing. You see huge investments being made, all rightly so. Um, but that could change depending on how the economy changes. So, you know, I would say it's, it's, it's difficult to say, but I would say at the very least, the future holds more automation, more kind of self-service, and probably more niche-based um, niche services. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, real impor the really important question here is what problems will we be solving in the legal practice in the future to which we need to apply technology? Um, I, I'm a great believer with Richard that access to justice is the number one issue on the planet. 
exactly. with respect to, to law. Yeah. And, and what's so interesting here is that it really doesn't impact the people in this room as much as it impacts that 54% of the world that doesn't have access. I mean, the people who are suffering from access to justice are by and large not hiring scaven arts, right? right? right. They, they can't hire anybody. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out how to bring justice to people who don't have it, and there'll be a lot of technologies around that. I think the second thing is you to look at a technology like blockchain. What is the issue that blockchain is really trying to address is immutability mm -hmm. of, of a certain data stream or a certain uh, a data set. So maybe one of the problems we're trying to solve is immutability. Maybe the problem that we're trying to solve is, is really good tracking, better data. Um, so it's figuring out what those problems are we need to look at. And, and certainly access to justice is right up there. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Sure. You know, I mean, it's, it's a great, great point. In fact, you know, I was saying earlier how you have to think not just like big law firms, they have to think of, you know, a lot of people in the legal world ecosystem. Um, you know, something I say all the time in, in, our, in our blockchain practice, and, you know, it applies to law and technology as well as we think about it. If you think of, you know, if you're an American and someone says, like, picture in your mind the average person. So, I don't know, you're thinking of someone like living in Oklahoma, you know, working at some, like, small business. Like, the average person in the world is someone living in rural China without access to, like, a lot. And if you look at sort of law and technology and how it might shape the world and not just sort of U.S. legal practice, there's a whole, sorry, no pun intended, world out there mm -hmm. of issues to solve. Access to justice is a great example of that. Um, and just the ability, you know, to contract, to, to contract with other people, transact with other people. Um, the technology can do a tr have a tremendous impact on globally that far exceeds, you know, anything Skadden Arps you know, or any medium to large size law firm will, you know, ever do in its lifetime. Oh, and you have to think of whole areas of the law, not just about technology, that are being impacted by technology. I mean, as is the case in medicine, is always my favorite example, it, yeah. is that medical technology outstrips medical ethics constantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like we can do things to sustain life, and but do we want to? Is that the ethical thing to do? I mean, I'm not going to take a position on that, but I'm saying technology often pushes the boundary of ethics. So for those of you that are just early in your careers or, or in school, be think about areas of the law that are going to emerge as a result of technology. And that's a really important problem to solve also, I think. Um, and, and an opportunity where knowledge of technology is going to actually make you a better lawyer because you're going to be in emerging areas. And law schools absolutely need to do a great job of that. One of my friends who's a law school dean said, I can't get my contracts professor to put a software contract in his class. It's still railroad contracts. There's a lot that law schools can do. And, um, and actually our organization, our professional organization, has a, has a working group of law schools that are trying to help transform technical literacy at the law school level. That's an important point. I think that we need to bear in mind that legal practice has only taken baby steps into machine learning. Uh, finance, retail, medical, they are light years ahead of us in terms of predictive modeling, in terms of a mining of deep learning, big data lakes, all that sort of stuff. We have a long way to go, but we will be going there because our clients are already there. And the expectation, it's not immediate, but the expectation is increasing. So as a practitioner, especially with the ethical duty of technical competence, you need to be aware. You don't need to know everything. I wouldn't say you need to learn to code. Some people say that. But you need to know a dork, or you need to know enough to know when to ask for help, or you need to know issue spot. This sort of thing requires this sort of technology. It's going to help you better service your clients to understand that basic level, and then specialize in whatever practice area you want. I mean, that's and not my be thought. suspicious of data. I mean, I, I see kind of an inherent suspicion of big data in some places. That's, that's, and so, again, the, the comment Richard was making about, I can never see 120 million, whatever, of, the, of these things that somebody else can't see. A machine can process that. Is, is data is actually a good thing, right? It's like a computer. I'm not going to write everything by hand because it's me doing it. I'm going to use a computer because it's faster and better. Mm -hmm. So we have about a minute and a half left. Any, any closing thoughts? Because this is a, a, a good beginning to, I think, what's going to be a really fascinating couple days. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I would say a couple things. I would say, number one, um, don't forget about the duty of, tech com of technical competence. It's not. 38 states required in the U.S. Now. Exactly, and, and growing. And it's not the most well-written rule in the world. <laughs> um, but that's very typical for 
lawyers and writing, um, which is another subject. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, but basically, as Kat laid out, it's just really important to just know what tools are out there and what problems they can solve because I think that speaks to not just you being a good lawyer, it speaks to you being a good service professional and you also being able to address, um, which is you know probably one of the largest issues out there, this whole access to justice thing. Because if you can help use tech to provide services to people who don't even know what services they need but know they have a problem, you know, you're doing, you're not just doing a good thing, you're also helping move the profession forward. And the other thing I will say is that um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, I'm not gonna touch upon the tech versus coding debate because I've been dragged into many debates around that, that subject, but I, I think that there's a duty to just understand that tech is there, tech is a tool, you need to know that it's there and you need, you need to at least have a basic understanding of what you can do with it um, and I think that starts at the law school level, quite frankly. I think that law schools need to um, incorporate into their curriculums some technology learning. And, not, and by that I mean not just here's a laptop, take your notes on the laptop. No, I'm talking about actually understanding tech tools that people use in their practice. It doesn't have to be anything complicated, but just kind of workflow practice tools. Um, and other types of similar like tools. Um, and I think that will not just help you be a better lawyer, but frankly just help you be a lawyer, period, and stop. Um, I would add to what Colin said, I think that technology in practice is actually the most challenging maybe now for the generation that's graduating law school than ever has been because you're digital natives, but the technology that you use, what, what I think of as technology, the tools you use every day are not very similar to the tools that you're gonna be using in your law practice. Um, and there are all kinds of tools that your people like me, your IT people are gonna tell you, I need you to track your time and I need you to do a conflicts check and you're gonna be like, I'm trying to practice law. The point is your law practice is a business and you also have to run your business. Um, I think the other thing is whenever technology comes up, don't, don't be afraid, even if you're a first year associate to say, why can't I? because sometimes you can and you just don't know it. Um, that there are tools there that are available for you, but you have to know what problem it is that you're trying to solve uh, with, with technology. Um, and don't be afraid as you move on in your practice to ask your clients what problems they're trying to solve and then try to marry technology to those problems because that's really what it comes down to is uh, a, a great mentor of mine used to be the CIO at Fresh Builds and was the CTO at UBS prior to that. So some big organizations and he used to say, listen to what your clients want and then give them what they need. Love exactly. it. So in the interest of time, I thought those are great comments. I'll pass and <laughs> just try to keep us on schedule. I thought those are great final thoughts. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Oh. really, really important. It's just we all wish that it was a little more specific as to what technical competence means, but that's another panel. <laughs> the fact that it exists at all is a good thing, so. Thank you. Thank you.